This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions and interviews on software engineering topics every two weeks. Thanks to our audience and the partners listed on our website for supporting the podcast. Okay, so uh, welcome listeners to another episode on Software Engineering Radio. Um, this time uh, we talk with uh, Roman Pichler about agile product management. Um, so uh, welcome, Roman. Um, hi, Martin. Hello. Great to have you here. Um, can you introduce yourself to our listeners? Hi, I'm Roman. I work as an independent consultant specialized in Scrum and Agile product management. I'm the author of two books on Scrum. My most recent one is called Agile Product Management with Scrum, Creating Products That Customers Love. And I first came across Agile practices in 1999, and I coached my first Agile project in 2001. Ever since then, I've been involved in helping organizations uh, leverage uh, Agile methods, particularly Scrum. And uh, in recent years, I've uh, primarily focused on uh, the role of the product owner in helping um, product managers understand what their place in this brave new Agile world is. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what is Agile product management from your point of view? Um, Agile product management, in, in, in my mind, differs uh, from traditional product management approaches in a number of, of areas. Um, so I think it's important to recognize that it is something genuinely different or genuinely new. Um, it's not just a slightly different way of um, um, carrying out uh, product management practices. Um, so there, there are five areas that I feel are, are, are key to understand how um, an agile Scrum-based product management approach differs from um, a traditional old-school approach. Um, and those five areas are um, the roles that we use, um, the collaboration we see between the different roles, um, the early upfront activities, um, how products are discovered and how product functionality is defined, and finally, how we leverage customer and user feedback. So those are five areas where we see significant differences. Um, if we look at the roles, then traditionally we have um, the responsibility for coming up with a vision for a new product and turning that vision into a successful product distributed across different roles, different people, different shoulders. Um, typically someone like a product marketeer would maybe come up with a product concept, would, would engage in market research activities, um, maybe carry out some business analysis. Um, a product manager would then take the product concept and derive um, a, a requirement specification from it. And a project manager would then run the actual development um, project. So different people are uh, engaged in the process, the process at different points in time, and they essentially hand off work results. Now, in an agile product management approach, certainly in a Scrum context, um, we have one person, the product owner, who is in charge of the product and who leads the project. So we, in a way, centralize those responsibilities that were distributed um, um, across many different roles, and we now have one person that, in a way, holds together the entire value stream. Can you give us a little bit more detail about what, what the product owner role in Scrum is? What, what does it look like? What responsibilities are connected to it? Can you give us a bit more details? Yes, uh, the product owner is, I, I find, a very interesting role in, in Scrum. Um, so, uh, you, you know, just to, to recap very briefly, there are only three roles in Scrum, so we don't have that many. <laughs> uh, the product owner, the Scrum master and the team. Um, and sometimes we say, well, you know, all those three roles really should 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 work together um, effectively and collaborate. So therefore, we also have what's called the Scrum team that uh, encompasses all the other three roles. Now, Ken Schwaber writes about the the product owner role in the Scrum Guide, and as since the Scrum Guide is, uh, you know, in a way the, the reference booklet for Scrum, I, I find it helpful to, to 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 take a look and see what Ken writes. Now, and he he says that the product owner is the one and only person who's responsible for managing the product backlog and ensuring the value of the work the team performs. And he also says this person maintains the product backlog and ensures that it is visible to everyone. Um, now, when I first read this uh, this little definition, I, I thought it sounds rather harmless. 
and, and often I think that's sort of that's people's first impression when they come across the product owner role. They think, yeah, yeah, okay, someone from the business side or someone who somehow represents the business or the customer, you know, some, a little bit like an on-site customer. Yeah, okay, whatever. Um, however, if you if you if you look more closely into the role, if you look into the role's authority and responsibility and the duties, you see that it is actually a very complex role um, with, a, with 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 many diverse responsibilities. So. Um, the product owner is, is typically responsible for what I would call strategic and technical aspects um, of uh, managing a product. So um, the product owner typically leads product discovery, but also helps to identify and describe requirements, um, makes sure that the product backlog is ready, ready for the next sprint planning meeting, um, and engages in, in, in uh, product planning, in envisioning and product road mapping. And uh, the individual typically decides on the content of a release, carries out release planning, review work results and provides feedback to the team, and manages customers, users and stakeholders. So it's, as I said, a, a diverse, multifaceted and often challenging role that the product owner duties often cut across um, the responsibilities of existing roles such as um, the product marketeer, product manager, and project manager. So it often doesn't fit easily into existing organizational structures. Do, do you think that just one person inside a team can carry all those different roles into one, uh, one new product owner role? Or do you think of, of multiple people playing this role or talking to each other or having a team or something like that? Well, that's an interesting question. Now, Scrum says that there has to be one person who takes on, who plays the product owner role. Um, now, in, in my experience, one product owner can only look after a limited number of teams. And, you know, I feel, you know, two to three teams is, is a fairly, fairly, is, is a fairly, la fairly large number um, of teams to look after. So the, the product owner role typically doesn't scale beyond two to three teams. Now, if you develop a product um, that requires a larger project with more teams, you obviously need more product owners. So in that sense, yes, you can have more product owners, and those product owners will then collaborate as part of a product owner team. However, um, one of those product owners would have to be the overall or chief product owner in charge of the entire product and the entire project. Um, so what you'd like to avoid is working with uh, what's sometimes called a product owner committee, a, a committee, a group of product owners, where it's not clear who has the final say if no consensus can be reached. Okay, so the, I remember, I don't know if it's Kent Beck or so, um, talking about the, the, the on-site customer, this, this one voice to the team, so speaking with one voice to the team and collecting all the different opinions from, from different peoples um, into one stream of um, stories, priorities, features you would like to have. Yeah, the idea we, we have with the product owner is very similar. Um, the product owner really is the person who ultimately decides what goes into a release, um, who decides in which order the items in the product backlog um, are worked on. Um, so the product owner is the ultimate decision maker with anything with regard to the, what the product looks like and what the product uh, does. Um, I, I write in my new book that the product owner you know, is a little bit special. Um, with regards to product success. I mean, ultimately, we call product owner, scrum master and team all pigs in scrum because they, because, because they all have skin in, in, in the game. They're all responsible for making sure that a successful product is created. But the product owner is particularly responsible for the product success and making sure that value is created. Um, and, and hence, it's only fair to make sure that the product owner is adequately empowered, has the authority um, to decide on the contents of of the release. Okay, I see. Uh, would you, would you agree that this? It's, for me, it sounds like like this guy is um is pretty responsible for for many things. He has to decide on, on the business value, so what is available to the team, what is not available to the team or to the product, uh, to the customer. Um, he has to decide in, in which steps, which priorities to realize is uh, how to how to pack these things into small releases and stuff like that it sounds uh, like a, a pretty hard job would you agree i'd agree that it is a challenging job and it's a very multifaceted job so uh, the product owner has to or product owners often have to um, 
take on a diverse range of responsibilities. And I think it's also very interesting when you think about it that Scrum centralizes responsibilities that are traditionally scattered ac across many different roles in one role. Mm. Now, the reason we do this is to make sure that there is one person who's in charge of the product, who's in charge of the value stream, and you know, ideally looks after the product across multiple releases, if not uh, manages the product's life cycle. Um, Ken Schwaber writes uh, in his second book that the focus of the product owner should be on return on investment. Now, if you think about how long it takes for return on investment to be to actually manifest itself, then that typically requires the product to be in the market for some time, uh, maybe a year, maybe two, maybe even a little bit longer. So if you want to uh, measure uh, the product owner's job in a way um, by the return on investment and reaching return on investment goals, then that means that the product owner has to look after the product for an extended period of time. Um, so it's, it's, it's product, being a product owner is... Um, I, I view being the product owner as a very important job, as a, as a job that um, provides a lot of visibility or should provide a lot of visibility. Um, if you're the product owner for a strategically important um, product, you may have sponsorship from a senior management, uh, from the CEO or managing director, him or herself. Um, so, so again, I think it's important to recognize that uh, product owners have to be adequately empowered in order to be able to uh, take on uh, the many duties, the many responsibilities they have. Mm. Um, so let's let's take a look in a little bit more detail what what uh, what these product owner what he really does. Um, your book, I think if I remember that correctly, is entitled um, Agile Product Development or Product Management. I'm creating products that customers love. So. How do you how do you ensure that the that the customers will love your product? Uh, I'm tempted to say you'll have to go and uh, read my book to <laughs> to really understand how to do it. But I can certainly try to summarize a few key techniques to make sure that we create products that that hopefully uh, the, the customers will will enjoy will love. Um, the first thing that I suggest in my book is to make sure that there is a shared product vision available, so that product owner, scrum master, and team uh, have a vision. Um, that guides their development effort and that roughly describes describes it at a course grant level what the product should look like and do. Um, I think that's very important, uh, you know, to have a goal, have a commonly agreed, a shared goal to shoot for. Um, second, um, I think it's uh, it's key to to involve customers and users in the development process. Um, and, and the way, the best way to do this in an agile context is um, a to invite customers and users, at least selected customers and users, to the sprint review meetings. Um, let them see the demo of the product increment. Let them engage in the discussion, participate in the discussion. Ask them for feedback. Ask them if they if they like what they just uh, or they or they what they what they've just seen. Um, ask them for ideas how the product could be improved. And, and use use the conversation to adapt the product backlog and adapt the product and, and drive um, the development of future product increments. And secondly, um, release product increments as early and as frequently as you can. Uh, get them out. You, you know, I mean, if you're concerned about keeping a competitive advantage, you don't necessarily have to release to the whole wild world. Maybe again, there's only a selected uh, group of customers and users you release an early product increment to maybe in form of an alpha or, or beta version. Um, but that should be then adequately tested and documented, of course, in a, in a Scrum context. Um, and, and, and again, by listening to the response that comes back from, from those customers and users uh, that uh, test uh, an early product increment in, in its target environment, um, that will help you to uh, um, um, adapt your product uh, and, and make sure you're developing the right product. So the key for me really is to integrate customers and users early on in the development process and keep them engaged, um, and keep them involved in the development of, of the product. Now, the last thing I'd like to recommend is to um, focus on what I call the, the minimal marketable product, a product that has a small feature set, um, the minimum functionality necessary in order to, to market and sell the product. Um, and that's so important because it allows you to reduce your time to market. And the shorter your time to market is, the, is the quicker you receive the actual market response. Uh, 
Now it's all good and well to invite selected customers and users to your sprint review meetings, that's great. And it's also great to uh, ship early product increments to maybe selected customers and users. But they may or may not be completely representative for the wider market you're aiming for. So by actually um, making your product uh, accessible, available to the, to the general public, to your entire market population, so to speak, um, you get the real feedback and you see if the product you're building is the right product or not. Um, and that's a technique that Google has, um, has employed very successfully. Is this um, completely different from, uh, you mentioned Google, um, from a company like, uh, for example, Apple doing all these fancy new product development stuff uh, completely secretly inside the company and then goes to public when it's, when it's final? I don't think so. Um, when you look at when you look at Google, then you'll find that uh, Google has uh, different forms of um, conf con confidentiality when it comes to new new products. So uh, the products like Google News that anybody can see at an early stage, like you and me, um, then there are products that are a little bit more um, com confidential. But Google has a, a specific program to which uh, Google employees can invite close friends and family members. And then there are top secret programs like uh, the Google Chrome browser development project, the Android project, and similar projects that Google keeps on the wraps. And uh, Google then still uses um, um, the technique of releasing product increments early and frequently but only in terms of internal releases. So Google uses its own employees as a sounding base to help drive the development of the, the product and make sure that the development team doesn't get stuck in a rut and uh, you know uh, gets good feedback from people that um, are, are, are not involved in the, in the project on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. Um, if I transfer this to, 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 to my context doing mostly business application development, inside a company, an insurance company or whatever. Um, so I could imagine putting putting a beta or whatever to to um, to a small group of people trying that out. Um, but it's it's a lot more difficult to use this this beta version in real production usage because put the software in production usage it requires a huge huge amount of, of whatever putting databases and data to all these new product versions and stuff like that so you cannot use the regular production version of the system together with a brand new beta version um, so how do you ensure that you get get real good feedback from those guys i think the the scenario you just mentioned uh, shows that the the environment the infrastructure is optimized for um, infrequent um, deployments of large chunks of functionality, which, you know, has been the case in most IT organizations that I've, I've been in touch with. Um, and now I remember uh, working um, with one specific client a few years back, um, um, a credit card company, um, and we, um, we, we found it difficult to release uh, early for the very uh, same reasons, for the same reasons that you just uh, mentioned. But what we did is we invited um, representatives from the user community uh, to come to the Sprint uh, review meetings and uh, we, we invited them to, to provide feedback on the demo. And we also asked them to come and attend Sprint review meetings on a regular basis to create some continuity. And that was um, that turned out to be very helpful. It was very valuable for everyone, including the product owner, to receive that feedback. Uh, it certainly helped to uh, move the product in the right direction. And it was also very beneficial for the users because they really um, they saw the, what the product uh, would look like, um, and they, they they could better anticipate the impact the new functionality had on their day to day work. But you would also agree that that it's more important to release frequently. Um, so if you have the chance to say, okay, if I uh, if I have the chance to release uh, the sprint the sprint result. Um, to, to the whole community, uh, instead of just inviting the users, you would always prefer releasing the software, would you? I probably would have a preference to release software early and frequently. I, I think it's, you know, ideally I'd like to do both. <laughs> I'd like to have users and customers present because that gives you the ability to facilitate qualitative feedback, to engage in a conversation. 
you know, you know, the sprint review meeting, the demo provides a nice context. So you both look at the product increment and then you can engage in a conversation. You can talk about what you've just seen. Um, you can talk about what works well, what doesn't work so well and identify improvement potential. You, you don't get that conversation. You don't get this dialogue if you, if you deploy, if you release. However, if you release, um, you get more, uh, quantitative feedback um, you know you, you you find out better which uh, defects and, and bugs are hidden in in the product um, users will will end up using the product in unanticipated ways um, that may cause all sorts of opportunities and problems and, and again you wouldn't get this type of feedback if you only showed your customers and users the product um, in the sprint review meeting so you know I suggest do both whenever you can do both Okay, I see. So uh, coming back to these, uh, you mentioned the minimal marketable feature, um, which you can release or which pro provides uh, the business value. Um, how do you or how does the, the product owner, what what criteria can he use to, to decide what is a minimal releasable feature or minimal marketable feature uh, and what it's not? So let me explain my background. Um, sometimes when I talk to people about this kind of agile development, um, they argue, especially the, the, the product owner people, they argue, oh, I have this feature and I can release this feature only at a whole, just this feature. And uh, the team says, oh, we, we need half a year to release, uh, to, to, to build that feature. And this is not what I, what I imagine with a minimal marketable feature, uh, what, a, what such a feature should be. So how do you, how do you help those guys to find out what what really small features can be and how they can cut down their features into small units. I, I prefer the, the term minimal marketable product. Um, uh, it obviously is a deliberate reference to the term that you've just uh, mentioned, minimal marketable feature set, which was coined by a book published in 2004, Software by Numbers. Um, now, the idea in this book is that you truly identify a group of features, a set of features, um, and that you can somehow market, somehow sell, and then you incrementally, in a way, sell your product while you develop it. And even though I find that fascinating and very attractive in theory, I found it very difficult to put it in practice. Hence, um, I find it, I find it more helpful to say, okay, now we want to build a new product. Um, say you want to build a new iPhone killer. Um, what would be the essential? features, the essential product attributes that this product would have to realize in order to be a market success. And I'm not looking for a long list of 20, 25, 30 features. Uh, you know, that's easy to generate. We'll just sit down and brainstorm for five minutes and whoops, we've got a long list. I'm looking, I'm looking for the three, uh, I'm looking for the three, three to five top features that must be there to provide um, a, a value added. Um, to give us uh, a, new, a unique selling proposition and entice customers to buy the product. Now, that, that is all part of envisioning the product and creating the product vision, as far as I'm concerned. And um, I find it very interesting that the Scrum literature so far has been um, largely silent on, on what the product vision is in Scrum. Um, we've said, oh, you need a product vision, and that goes right back to the very first Scrum book, which was published in 2002. Um, but we've um, we've been very secretive about what the vision should really look like, uh, what kind of questions it should answer, what the qualities of a good vision vision in Scrum should be. Um, so I think it's it's essential to to take some time before you start with the first sprints um, to to think about what kind of product are we building, and it all starts with 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 asking yourself. Who are our customers? Who are the target customers, the people that we'd like to buy our product? And who do we believe will actually use our product? Who do we believe the users are? And which of their needs is the product going to address? Which, 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 problems, which, which problems is the product going to solve for those users and customers? Um, which jobs is it, is, is it going to do for them? And that helps you then to um, identify the right functionality and again, for me, the key here is to really focus on, on, on those features that must be present to ensure product success. And it's, I find it's the opposite approach that particularly large companies tend to take, where often when a product is conceived um, or envisioned, uh, people try to think of a perfect product with loads of functionality. 
that does many different things. And, um, you know, that could be the product that is available maybe in a year's or two years time after you've uh, shipped version 1, 1 1.5, 2 and 2.5. Um, but what you'd really like to do is to say, OK, out of all those, out of all this long term dream, um, what is really the smallest thing that you could build and ship within a competitive time frame? And that still creates enough value, so it's 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 usable for the users, and customers will want to will want to buy it, even if it's maybe contains a lot less functionality um, than than other products in the same area, right? That's absolutely right. You know, I've mentioned building an iPhone killer. Look at what Apple did with uh, the original iPhone that shipped in two thousand seven. Um, when the phone first came out, many many critics said it's it's a very limited thing you know it's an ipod you you happen to be able to make phone calls and by the way the voice quality is poor and it doesn't have this and it doesn't have that and it's true you know i mean it didn't have you know there were many things that the iphone couldn't do when it was first launched um no copy and paste it took apple two years to rectify this problem i believe uh, you couldn't even send uh, text messages to multiple recipients um but I don't think I don't think that was a problem that Apple deliberately neglected or left out some functionality. I actually think that gave Apple a competitive advantage. They didn't make the mistake to say, "Oh, now we look at all this all the, all the competitor products and copy all the functionality that they provide, plus more functionality on top of it." Thinking, you know, bigger must be better, and more functionality means, oh, you know, um, customers are more likely to buy the product. They really focused on a small, uh, narrow target group and 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 that's one of the key tricks if you want to get to a minimal marketable product that you clearly define your target group so they are only focused on the consumer group within their customer space and and said okay all those business and enterprise users where a lot of money can be made for, for now we'll, we'll just not target them and, and even within that group they were looking for people that maybe had a certain affinity to apple and were into design and, and stylish gadgets and, and those people just loved the iPhone and, and that built the success. And what Apple then did is, or the basis of the success, what Apple then did is they increment, they've, they've incrementally enhanced the product since they first brought it out. They, they made an incremental update in terms of hard and software in 2008, and then again an incremental update in 2009. So, um, you know, leaving functionality um, out of the product, focusing on a, on a narrow target uh, group, a uh, group of, of target customers uh, are, 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 are key ways to achieve a, a product with minimum functionality. Mm, so you would, if I summarize that, you would agree that uh, the most important part for the product owner is not finding all the features that he would like to get, but finding the right ones or the most important ones? Absolutely right, yes. And I think it's, you know, again, it, we just change the process. When you look at product definition, requirements, engineering, in an agile context, then it's the opposite of what we do traditionally. Uh, traditionally, we try to define the product up front as completely and as much detail and as precisely as we possibly can. Why? Well, because we'll, we'll, we'll need a requirement specification that should be more or less frozen. And yes, you can have requirements changes, but they're strictly controlled and they should be the exception. Now, in, in an agile context, the whole process works completely differently. We, we start literally with a sketchy vision. We say, hey, wouldn't it be a cool idea? You know, when we're building this kind of product and here are the three to five top features, those are going to be the customers and users that are going to buy it. And this is why, why they will want to buy it and use the product. And then, then, then we, we use that vision to create an initial product backlog that will also be very sketchy. Most of the items in the product backlog will be highly underspecified. Um, and, and we then use early customer and user feedback to decide how exactly, what exactly the product is going to look like and what exactly it's going to do. So rather than making all those assumptions about the product functionality and the look and feel, the user experience up front, we do it um, as we go along. And, and, and the key thing, again, is to integrate customers and users into the development process and leverage their feedback to drive the development of the product. Do you think that you need to look at the usability aspects of those features uh, when when building these first increments as well certainly um, i think usability um, plays plays a, a key part in developing a product now I, I i would i would i would i would recommend that um, key aspects 
of a product's usability are addressed as part of envisioning the product. So I would expect that individuals, depending on how you manage your ideation and early innovation management activities in your companies, you know, that individuals are given some time and innovation budget, uh, or that the, the, the Scrum team together engages in those early activities, that individuals play around and, and create prototypes, and that also visual prototypes are created um, that explore the user interface, that explore how the, the whole user user experience piece should play out. So I would expect that areas of the product um, uh, that are important to the product success, where the product is supposed to excel, and, and areas um, that will be difficult to change at a later point in, in, in time that exhibit a certain amount of risk are explored early on as part of the visioning process in firm form of prototypes, typically throwaway prototypes. And then certainly also by prioritizing the product backlog the right way and um, making user experience related uh, requirements high priority in the early sprints. Okay, so um, if we go back to the to the role of the product owner and his responsibilities, we talked briefly about um, putting all these small features uh, or maybe user stories, uh, however do you call them, um, in the product backlog and, and developing the product backlog for the different iterations and sprints and releases. So can you can you tell us a little bit more about this this work with the product backlog? Product backlog, yes. So maybe maybe it's 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 a worthwhile exercise that we briefly reflect on what the product backlog is. And the product backlog is is really something very very simple. It is it is the outstanding amount of work necessary to bring the product to life. So it it, it contains it's a queue of, of of all the work that needs to be done in order to create a successful product. Um, most of the items in the product backlog are typically related to the product's product functionality and describe the product's functionality are hence requirements. But you could have other items in there as well, uh, including um, um, fixing bugs, defects, um, or, or creating other deliverables that may be necessary. So, so that's what it is. It's a, it's a list of outstanding uh, work. However, in, in addition to, to just being a list, it, it should fulfill four qualities that um, Mike Cohen and I have started to call the, the deep qualities. Um, so just a list uh, of, of, of outstanding work is not enough to qualify as a product backlog. Uh, you could take a traditional requirement specification and copy, pay, copy and paste it into a spreadsheet and then say, hey, you know, it's a list of outstanding work. Here's our product backlog. Well, that trick doesn't quite work um, since the product backlog has to be detailed appropriately. And that's the first quality. And that means the high priority items have to be more detailed, more fine grains, um, have to be more specific than lower priority ones. The low priority items can be pretty big, um, quite sketchy and underspecified and very coarse grained. Mm. Um, the second uh, property of the of the product backlog is that it emerges. So its, it's content evolves throughout the project. Um, as I tried to explain earlier, we, we move away from this idea in an agile environment that requirements are fixed or that we can 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 precisely anticipate, predict at an early stage um, what the product should look like and do in detail. Rather, um, we say, OK, um, based on the customer user feedback, we learn more about um, uh, their needs and how we can best um, um, address their needs and therefore what exactly the product should look like and do. So new requirements are discovered and new requirements are entered into the product backlog, uh, as I said, throughout the project. Um, so so the, the, the product backlog has a very organic quality. It's, it's, it's by no means fixed or frozen in, in, in any way. And then finally, the other two uh, qualities, which um, um, are probably a little bit more well known, um, are the product backlog has to be estimated, its items have to be sized, and it has to be prioritized. So all the items in the product backlog have to be ordered. So those are the four qualities of of the product backlog. Just just a question, but but you mentioned that the the the, the items in the product backlog are, are of different size and of some of them are very detailed and precise, and some of them are rather sketchy. So how do you ensure that the sketchy ones are estimated, or or does the the estimation um, requirement um, just focuses on the on the high priority? Um, items. No, in fact, the, the idea we have is that uh, you estimate the entire product backlog. Um, what happens is that your lower priority items will be um, 
will receive uh, a larger estimates and b that there's more uncertainty around the estimate so that the quality of the estimates uh, will be poorer than uh, the the quality of an estimate of a high priority item uh, but but don't forget that um, the estimates of product backlog items are exclusively used in scrum to aid release planning to understand how far have we come and to create a forecast um, about how long it's going to take to finish or how much functionality you'll be able to deliver within a given time and budget frame so you, we, we don't use um, estimates in the product backlog with estimates of requirements the same way they're used in traditional project management so what happens is that um, as product backlog items um, are worked on um, they're decomposed they're refined they're broken down into smaller items they, they are made more specific and those new items are then estimated again and, and and therefore so over time you see the product backlog grow and you see that the team becomes more confident in in the estimates uh, obviously also because the team learns about how much uh, work it actually is to implement product backlog items and, and this learning then feeds back into um, estimating product backlog items and estimating product backlog items forms part of um, managing or grooming the product backlog and managing the product backlog grooming the product backlog is an ongoing process so it's not that once at the beginning of the project before the first sprint you go over the product backlog and you estimate all the items and you prioritize it and you make sure it's ready and then that's it you're done now because you have customer feedback and user feedback um, uh, influencing the product backlog and because requirements emerge and because uh, items are taken out of the product backlog the team consumes items product backlog items pulls them into the sprint and transforms them into product increments the product backlog needs to be constantly um, or at least regularly groomed and, and managed and and managing grooming the product backlog is a collaborative process in scrum it's it's teamwork so it's something the product owner has to lead and drive but it's also a process where scrum master and team members and as appropriate stakeholders including customers and users participate in um, we've, we've already mentioned one specific aspect of product backlog grooming where uh, customers and users are involved and that's um that's in the sprint review meeting when you discuss the demo you discuss the product increment and uh, users and customers uh, may have good ideas about new 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 product functionality new requirements so you said that the, the the product owner is responsible for prioritizing all these these items what about these kind of non-functional requirements that every project has now non-functional requirements um, are very interesting uh, in a number with regards to a number of aspects um, the first the first thing to notice is that non-functional requirements uh, come in sort of two loose groups i would say um, there are non-functional requirements that, that are related to the user experience such as usability requirements style and design requirements for instance and there are non-functional requirements that are related to the operational qualities of the system things like performance robustness um, scalability interoperability and and others now some of those non-functional requirements can be global in nature and that means they basically apply to all the other functional items in the product backlog you know, things like you know again if you think about the mobile phone being able to make and receive calls for instance those would be functional um, requirements functional properties and global non-functional requirements would apply to virtually all other functional requirements and then you get some local non-functional requirements that only apply to one or two specific um, items in the product backlog functional items in the product backlog now i i quite like to work with structured product backlog um, and i quite like to work with hierarchical product backlogs and what i do in order to deal with particularly global non-functional requirements is to create a separate area in the product backlog um, can be a separate column in a spreadsheet or it can be just part of your product backlog task board if you have a physical uh, product backlog that you use and uh, I put the, uh, the, the the key global or the, I put the global non-functional requirements in there and typically you only get about a handful or so of global non-functional requirements and I keep them there so that they're visible and um, we don't forget about them because obviously they have a big impact they have a big impact on the user experience and user experience is related to 
um, how likely it is that users are going to use the product, how likely it is that customers are going to buy the product. They also have an impact on architecture and technology choice, and therefore on total cost of ownership and life expectancy of the product. So they have a big, they have a big economic impact. But what I don't do is I don't ask the team to estimate those global non-functional requirements. I rather integrate them into the definition of done or state in the definition of done that those global non-functional requirements have to be met. So they create cost, they create an effort. Um, it's not free to have those global non-functional requirements, but the way the effort is accounted for is indirectly by estimating the functional requirements, the global non-functional requirements applied to. So that's that's one way of doing it. Um, and I found that quite 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 a helpful, quite an effective way of, of dealing with uh, global non-functional requirements. Um, local non-functional requirements, how you deal with them is a little bit dependent on um, the uh, requirements description technique that you use. If you use user stories, then you can simply capture um, those requirements as, as constraints and attach them to your individual cards, your story cards. And I've also seen teams um, capture non-functional, local non-functional requirements as acceptance criteria of uh, stories. So that's that's also something that some teams do. How would you how would you deal with the with changes to these global non-functional requirements? So if uh, after half a year um, someone decides to oh we we need to modify the look and feel of the application um, slightly. Um, would would you say it's 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 just a normal task uh, that the product owner can prioritize into the um, sprint backlogs? So before I answer your question, let me uh, let me maybe um, make make another thing uh, something else clear. Um, what what I've tried to explain earlier is that we try to delay decisions about the details of the product functionality until more information becomes available and until we receive feedback from customers and users. Uh, now that's true for most aspects of the product but it shouldn't be true for the critical global non-functional requirements. Say you want to build uh, a new mobile phone, then certain non-functional requirements such as weight, um, such as size um, and, and, and robustness will be critical, will be critical to the product success, uh, will be critical to the product design, will be critical to the um, choice of uh, materials, um, the architecture you use. Um, so you've got to make those choices early on and do enough prototyping as part of creating the product vision to um, to be fairly confident to feel fairly confident that you've made the right choices so um, don't delay detailing detailing global non-functional requirements um, do the opposite so they're the big exception to the general rule of oh you know just delay requirements and delay the specifics of the product for as long as you can um, now I think it's it's perfectly normal that uh, to a certain extent also uh, you know, usability and, and user interface and user experience related requirements evolve and that particularly that the details do emerge that's okay and it's also okay that um, once the product's been in production or once the product's been released somebody says we'd like to make some changes it just needs to be then planned in and um, the way i do this is that um, I, I i use a product roadmap once the first version has been introduced into the market successfully to capture ideas for future releases um, to look ahead for the next two to three releases for the next maybe 12, 18, 24 months max. So that um, customers, users, that the business has an idea how the product is likely to grow. Um, so I, I, I tend to restrict the additional visioning activities and the, the original product vision to the, to the first version. And then I tend to use the product roadmap to carry out essentially product planning. I see. So this leads us uh, to to the discussion of uh, release cycles. I think. Uh, what do you think? How do you define the the scope of a release? For for me, the the scope of a release is defined by the product vision and the initial product backlog, certainly of uh, version one point zero, product version one point zero, and then of later product versions, uh, the contents, the scope is defined by the product roadmap. So that's the way I work. Um, ultimately, as the product owner. As the entire scrum team whenever you discover an idea for your product for your release you should ask yourself if this idea is truly essential is it truly critical to achieve product success if it is well then it should be part of the release if it isn't it's maybe a good idea but it is irrelevant so i wouldn't even bother putting it into the product backlog some people think well you know it's such a shame to waste good ideas so let's just put it right at the bottom of the product backlog 
uh, and this is where it stays sometimes for months or years. But um, you know, I'm, I'm quite a big fan of um, concise product backlogs, short product backlogs. So I just tend to say, well, you know, if it's not relevant for this for this release or this version, then let's just not bother about it because who knows? The only thing that's certain about the future is that it's uncertain. We don't know exactly if the product's going to be a success. We don't know exactly how the next version is going to be received in the marketplace. So let's just wait for that first before we exactly decide what should go into the next in, into, into the next versions. So the product vision and the product roadmap should facilitate deciding what goes into a release. And how do you define the, the time frame for release? So a huge, a huge amount of agile teams having completely different time frames for, for releases. Some of them releases uh, every three months. Some of them releases every month. Some of them are releasing every day. Would you think it's, it's, it's just depending on your business or and does it have an, an impact on how you deal with the product backlog? I think it does depend to a certain extent on your business, uh, certainly on your business model. It does depend on the technologies you use, the type of product you're building. Uh, if you build a web-based product, then it's certainly much easier to uh, release very frequently than when you develop embedded software. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult um, um, and, and your release cycles may be a little bit longer. Similar if you develop an iPhone application, then well, you know what stops you from um, uh, releasing uh, the next version quickly? Um, whereas if you develop, for instance, a healthcare product, then you know you'll have to go through uh, some sort of form of certification and comply to uh, regulatory requirements before you can you can you can ship it before you can launch it. Um, the, the general recommendation you find in the Agile books is to stick to three to six months when it comes to with regards to the the length of, of projects. And particularly in, in the second XP book, uh, Kent Beck makes an interesting I find an interesting recommendation, and he says, well. If your projects take longer, then use quarterly cycles. Um, use quarterly cycles to subdivide your project and make sure you have at least one release in every quarterly cycle. So that's something I recommend too, um, and I find very helpful as, as a general rule of thumb. Now, how long it actually takes you to finish your project and to deliver the amount, the amount of functionality you want to deliver, um, uh, that's, that's an interesting question. And, and the traditional approach is to look at the requirements and to analyze the requirements and based on the requirements you have uh, create work packages and tasks and then do some dependency analysis maybe some critical path analysis assign activities to individuals um, and get the estimates from individuals for those activities and do some number crunching and you get a schedule and then you also get um, uh, a budget you also get the cost the likely cost that will be incurred by developing this this product now, if you if you want to employ this approach um, in an agile context, certainly in Scrum, uh, you'll hit one problem, and that problem is that the product backlog is dynamic. It changes, it grows, it's very organic. So, yes, you can analyze the contents of the product backlog at the beginning of the project, but you know that in two, three, four sprints time, those contents will have changed because your product will product backlog will have evolved. Um, so. I find this approach very difficult in an agile context. Hence, I prefer to ask, what is the window of opportunity? What is the time frame when we need to ship this product? Either because otherwise we believe we won't be able to sell as many products as we need to, or because simply this is when the business needs the new IT application. This is when marketing needs the new web application. They need it in three to four months time. That's the window of opportunity. And that window of opportunity um, is found based on the product vision. You look at the product vision, you look at um, uh, what kind of product you want to build. And um, I also quite like to do a little bit of uh, com competitor analysis as part of the visioning activities. So if you develop a commercial product that gives you an idea for about uh, a desirable launch time frame. Now, once you know the window of opportunity uh, and the type of product you're about to build, you can then think about who needs to work on, on the project and how big how is the, should the project be? How many teams will you have to use? And that gives you an initial budget, assuming that labor is the decisive cost factor, which it, I guess, typically is in software development. In other words, I quite like to time box releases. I like to work with a release time box and let the functionality um, vary. You may decide to also uh, f fix the budget, but I don't necessarily think that's I don't I don't think that's 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 always necessary. Uh, you know, I quite like to 
establish an early budget range, as I said, and then just simply see how fast you progress and then make a trade-off decision and say, okay, are we going to ship with less functionality or are we going to increase the budget and maybe add I don't know, a Ruby expert or a Java expert um, to the team to increase the team's velocity? And in the end, if the prioritization of the product backlog is correct and, and um, matches the business value, you always guarantee that you get the best for your money, right? Right. I would say if if you've done a good job envisioning the, the, the product and if you've done a good job involving customers and users early on uh, in the development process, you're very likely to build something that is valuable. The thing you have to then make sure is that you um, have a good package so that you give um, users a product that is truly usable uh, and that is uh, hopefully a joy to use. So, you know, again, uh, assuming that we're building a new mobile phone, there's certain features a mobile phone has to have. Um, now, I mentioned that the iPhone, the original iPhone, shipped without the ability to send multiple uh, text messages to multiple recipients. Um, so you can thin out certain areas of uh, your product functionality. You can thin out certain features, but you still need to provide a certain feature set in order to create uh, the necessary value. And, 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 and make people buy the product. But that's then really part of the release planning um, process. And, and release planning is something that the product owner should lead. And it's something that the, the team and the Scrum Master and also stakeholders engage in. The best point in time to have those conversations and make the decisions is again the sprint review meeting. As you clearly understand how far you've come at the end of the sprint, you've seen the demo, uh, and you can then together, you've got the right people present, hopefully, the Scrum Master, the product owner, the team, customer and user representatives, hopefully also representatives from marketing, sales, service, maybe management. And together you can then decide, okay, how are you going to take this forward? If you're running out of time, uh, are there any features, any areas of product functionality, uh, function, functionality you can thin out, where you can drop some of the detailed functionality? Um, or um, uh, can you find identify other requirements that um, are maybe uh, easier, uh, cheaper, faster to implement? So those 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 conversations form part of the release planning process. And as I said, a, a good point in time to have those conversations is in the sprint review meeting. Um, so uh, I think at the beginning we talked briefly about um, one project owner, project owner teams, or or large projects. Um, what do you think? What were the typical problems in in larger projects with these kind of doing product management the agile way? Well, I'm tempted to say uh, avoid large projects if you can. <laughs> in, you know, part of the the beauty of using uh, focusing on the minimal marketable product in a product with minimum functionality is that it allows you to reduce the project size. Um, it re therefore reduces the investment risk um, you take. Um, but but I also know that some projects, some products uh, require a larger project, project simply because of the, the, the inherent uh, complexity they have. The thing you want to watch out for is that you uh, don't necessarily start with uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten or more teams, but that you slowly grow your project. Um, uh, and that technique is called organic growth. So the idea is to start with ideally one team and then um, slowly grow the project from that one team that sort of forms the original seat if you want so or the original project cell and then gets split into two teams new people join those newly formed teams and again they then get split and um, the good thing about this is that um, this gives a small team a small that the, 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 the gives the original team and, and therefore you know a, a fairly small project the opportunity to um, a do the visioning and, and B stock the initial product backlog and build the, the first few product increments and establish the standards for the product and the project and it also makes sure that you pass on the knowledge so that's that's a general um, scaling strategy that I, th I I find helpful to be aware of um, there's another thing you, that I find helpful, and that is that we have a preference in the Agile world to use what's called feature teams over component teams. And feature teams are teams that implement features such as themes, groups of user stories. So, you know, small pieces of functionality. And, and, and the reason is that we prefer feature teams uh, is that they, they typically have less dependencies than component teams. And component teams are teams that are focused on components or subsystems. 
um, so they can 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 work um, with less dependencies, um, and they're actually able to um, create value. A component team in isolation can't create value. A component team is always always has to rely on other component teams and integrate with their work results in order to be able to have something that can be can be shown to to a customer or user. So again, you know, something to be aware of to to think about the project organization and um, consider this preference of of using feature teams. Um, in, in terms of agile product management and product ownership, um, as I've as I've said before, make sure there is one product owner who acts as the overall or chief product owner. Um, so even if you use um, a small product owner team with uh, two, three product owners, one of them has to be the overall or chief product owner. And it's not that we that we're looking for uh, the big leader, uh, the big decision maker. Uh, we just want to make sure that there's one person in charge of the overall project and overall product who facilitates decision making, who takes care of the overall product backlog grooming process and release planning process and keeps things together. And if uh, the product owners can't jointly make a decision, can't agree, there has to be one person that says, okay, this is the way we're doing things. Yes, you're likely to need more product owners, multiple product owners on a large project. Do make sure those product owners communicate well and collaborate well. Also make sure you have one product backlog for your product and make sure you use one release plan. So I find that one product backlog and one release plan helps to integrate the different views and helps to make sure that the teams align and identify themselves as much with the overall product and project as with their team and features or components that they implement. So I think we come to the end of the episode. So any any other pearls of wisdom you would like to share with our listeners? Pearls of wisdom. Um, well, maybe, maybe, maybe two things. Um, the, the first one, the first thing I'd like to say is, um, don't make the mistake of thinking, oh, you know, this product owner, this is just another role, and you know, if people are called product managers or pro product owners, it doesn't really matter. So let's just rebrand all the product managers, but nothing else changes. They're still far away from the development teams. They're still limited um, collaboration. They still don't take responsibility of uh, managing the product backlog. That would be a shame, and that would be a misunderstanding of what the product owner role is. A product owner role is about, and the product owner role for a Scrum-based agile product management approach really is um, a cornerstone. It's, it's really a key piece you've got to get right. So make sure you understand um, what the product owner role is all about. Make sure you um, select the right people and you empower and trust those people properly. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, the, the second thing I'd like to say is that fully establishing agile product management um, is likely to, to uh, cause some change. It's likely to be disruptive. Um, and it's likely to imply some form of organizational changes, such as adjusting um, development plans, a career path, uh, employee selection criteria, and, and similar things. Um, you'll have to ask yourselves as an organization, where should product owners come from? You know, um, um, I mean, being a product owner is essentially um, a product and project specific role. There's nothing wrong with product managers, product marketeers, and other, other um job roles and people playing on filling those job roles um, moving into the product owner role but that's that's one of the questions you have to answer so don't be surprised if it takes a while to establish agile product management and if it, if it requires some changes um, and otherwise i just hope that um, agile product management techniques help you build great products um, that become very successful and uh, help their customers and users and um, that you'll have uh, a lot of fun building those products great Thank you, Roman, for being on the show, and uh, good luck for your for your book. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Okay, so before we come to the real end of the episode, just a quick short remark at the end. Roman will give away three copies of his new book on Agile Product Management with Scrum to our listeners. All you need to do to win one of those copies is to follow us on Twitter, follow SE Radio on Twitter, and retweet the announcement of this episode um, with the additional tag APMS for Agile Product Management with Scrum. So add an hash APMS to your retweet of the announcement of this episode and uh, Roman will, um, will take a look at those uh, things and uh, draw those three winners and we will announce the 
winners uh, via Twitter. So uh, have fun and good luck for winning the book. Thanks for listening to Software Engineering Radio. Software Engineering Radio is an educational program brought to you by Hillside Europe. If you want more information about the podcast and all the other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. If you want to support us, you can donate to the SE Radio team via the website, or you can advertise for SE Radio, for example, by clicking on the Dig Reddit Delicious links and the slash dot button. To contact the team, please send email to team at se-radio.net, or if it is specific to an episode, please use the comments facility on the website so other people can react to your comments. This episode of SE Radio, as well as all other episodes, are licensed under the Creative Commons 2.5 license. Please see the website for details. Thanks to Charlie Crow and the Podsafe Music Network for the music used in this show. The song is called Vegas Hard Rock Shuffle.